Hi everybody. I think we can start today. Good morning everyone. Uh, today uh, Lorenzo Benuto is going to uh, talk about uh, GPS in general and uh, how to use GPS and data in uh, Android uh, applications and more of and more about that. So I'm going to leave the audience to him. So, okay. Thank you very much. I'm uh, Lorenzo Benvenuto and uh, I'm just starting the second uh, year of the PhD. I'm doing my PhD in a company which is uh, GTEP, uh, so that's the reason why I don't stay here so, so often. Uh, GTEP is a small company born in 2010 uh, like a spin-off of the University of Genoa and uh, it focuses, uh, our main focus is on geomatics and GIS systems. Uh, my, my work of PhD is based uh, on GNSS systems and in particular on GNSS uh, signals uh, acquired by smartphone. So uh, my presentation of today is divided uh, in different parts uh, and first of all I want to I wanna explain you some background about uh, GNSS systems. Uh, GNSS is the, the term uh, we in which we refer to all the uh, system of uh, artificial satellite uh, orbiting around the Earth. So there are mainly, uh, mainly four uh, systems, which is GPS, which is the American one, GLONASS, which is the Russian one, Galileo, which is uh, in 2020 will be uh, fully operational, hopefully, actually. Beidou is the Chinese one, and then we have some smaller one like the QZSS for the Japan, etc., etc. The main function of the satellite is to transmit uh, electromagnetic signals to the receivers placed uh, on the on the surface uh, of the of the Earth, and uh, uh, receive the, some information sent by uh, some stations. Uh, with those uh, information, the satellites can. Uh, operate some, some uh, corrections of the orbits uh, and quality control. And uh, uh, yes, they, they are used uh, basically for the, the positioning. The, um, the thing that is important is that uh, uh, they are projected in such a way that uh, every time and anywhere on the point uh, of the, on, uh, on a point uh, on the surface of the Earth, we can see at least four satellites. Uh, this is the basics uh, of the GNSS in general and how we can get the positioning starting from the satellites. Uh, it's all based uh, about the triangulation uh, on the distance between the satellite and the receiver. So in line of principle we need to see at least three satellites because the coordinates of course are three, so three, uh, three satellites at least. But uh, uh, three the, the satellites are not enough because the, the range between the receiver and the satellite actually is based on the time measurement. So, uh, as I'm going to explain uh, in a couple of slides, we need at least uh, four satellites. Uh, to understand why we need the four satellites, uh, I have to explain you uh, how the signals uh, is modulated and how in general the signals of the satellite is. Actually, we have uh, uh, a carrier, which is a sinusoidal wave, which is modulated with a pseudo-random noise, uh, which I called, actually, a sequence of 1 and minus 1. And um, every one of this code is unique for uh, every satellite. Actually, this is true for GPS system, not very true for GLONASS, for example, but um, in line of principle, we can assume that this is why. Um, we receive the, we have uh, at, uh, two frequencies for each satellite, not just one frequency, but two frequencies. And actually, uh, since 2009, we have also for some satellites uh, a third frequency. So these are the, uh, the principle, the, the equations uh, through which we, we can retrieve the, the, the range between the satellite and the receiver. We have two kinds of measurement. The code measurement, also called pseudo range, and the phase measurement. In the first one, uh, we get the, uh, the, the modulated signals from the satellite, and the receiver generates in, uh, in local uh, a replica of the, of the code, which is uh, uh, shift, shifted between the uh, acquired signal. 
So the receiver uh, just aligns the two signals and calculates the time uh, needed to align these two signals. If you multiply this, uh, this time, which is called the time of flight, for the uh, speed of light, we can obtain uh, the range between the satellite and the receiver. Which is the problem? The problem is that the signals uh, are made uh, using some clocks. And uh, the satellite uh, has different clocks uh, between the uh, uh, different clocks from the receiver. So uh, we have uh, a problem of synchronization, and that's why we need a full satellite for getting the uh, for getting the position. One more unknown. The other uh, me, uh, this uh, this observable this this instance is not that precise because. Uh, if you get an error, if you do an error in uh, determine, determine the, the time, you multiply this error for the speed of light, and so we get meters of error, more or less. Uh, Sorry, can I yeah. ask you a question because uh, it's a doubt that I have since uh, a couple of slides ago. Yeah. Can you explain me uh, the relationship between the number of satellites and the, and the position? So you, before you were saying that you needed at least the three, yeah, uh, at least three. If okay, um, three satellites because uh, you, you can see here the equation. This is the distance between two points. Okay, so the uh, the coordinates of the satellite are known because the satellites uh, travel through precise orbit. Okay, and the uh, coordinates of the receiver are unknown. But we determine, uh, the, we determine uh, the, the range between the satellite and the receiver using the time, using a difference of time here. And uh, we, have a di uh, we have an unknown of synchronization between the clock of the satellite and the clock of the receiver. So the, uh, the equation, have, uh, we account this error as a one more unknown for our system. So it's not that clear. To, to yes. For the yes. A fourth satellite is an, uh, is need for compensate this uh, unknown of time, okay. this shift uh, or between the two clocks. Uh, in line of principle, if the satellite and the receiver add the same clock, uh, you don't need this uh, this one more unknown. But it's not what happens. Uh, the second uh, means, uh, the second means to measure the, the distance between the, the, the satellite and the receiver are the phase measurement. So, uh, more or less, the principle is quite uh, is uh, very similar because uh, we received a satellite uh, signals from the satellite, but in this case, the signal is demodulated, so we get the sinusoidal signal from the satellite, and we generate in, uh, in to the receiver the uh, the signals and we overlap these two signals. So what the receiver measure is the uh, difference between uh, the, um, the shift okay, between the, the, the incoming signals and the, and the generated signals. The, what is unknown is the number of the uh, entire wavelength between the satellite and the receiver. This is one more unknown for every satellite we track. So we just don't need one more unknown to solve this problem, but we need uh, to observe the satellite for a, um, a bit of time in order to, uh, to, to get the disambiguity, disambiguity uh, solved. So I say uh, at least four satellites, we do a triangulation. We have a nonlinear equation system. We can solve it through least square or Kalman filter, it depends. And then we get uh, a metric decametric position. Why? Because uh, there are many errors affecting the GNSS signals. I can just explain a couple of, the, of those errors. For example, those equations are true if the signal travel through the vacuum, but through the signals from the satellite uh, travel to the ionosphere and the troposphere. So we get, the, for example, uh, errors depending on the ionosphere. But for, uh, this is important because the ionosphere uh, induces frequency-dependent error. So do you remember that I told the satellites have two frequencies, at least actually three frequencies. If we do a, a linear combination between frequency, we can neglect the ionosphere error. Then we get the troposphere error, which is not frequency-dependent, but there are methods to, uh, to solve this error. And one other most important error, when, uh, and I focus my PhD studies on this error, is multipath. 
uh, I will talk to you later about, uh, about multipath, but in line of principle, multipath happens when uh, the receiver is next to a surface, uh, reflecting surface, so the, the signal is not direct to the, to the receiver, but is reflected to, the, 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 to those surfaces. There are, uh, this method of positioning here, you just need a receiver and uh, the satellite, nothing else. But there are many different ways of positioning. For example, once is RTK, you uh, need two receivers, uh, and by operating difference uh, between the, uh, the, the, the receiver and actually calculating the baseline between two, the, those two receivers, you can neglect uh, some of those errors that I showed you before, because you can assume that the errors are the same between the two receivers if those two receivers are not too far between them. Uh, another method is called the RTK, uh, an RTK, sorry. Uh, you just need uh, a receiver and an internet connection because there are many structures uh, which are uh, permanent stations uh, uh, that uh, tells, you, uh, about, uh, tells you some corrections to apply to your system of equations in order to neglect uh, those errors. Uh, I put here also the, the, the icon of a common software free of open source which is RTK Lib for doing this kind of positioning. So you just need a receiver and an internet connection and someone else will tell you the correction to apply in order to obtain a, a positioning. Using a, an RTK you can get a position in the order of centimeters. Actually it depends on the receiver you are using but you can pass from meter, meter, decameter position to centimeter, also millimeter position if you have a very good GNSS receiver. Since now we talk about uh, the satellites and the signals, but now I want to focus your attention a little bit uh, on the GNSS receiver. And this is the basically architecture of a GNSS receiver. So first of all, you have an antenna, and these are all the hardware uh, present in the, in the GNSS receiver. So we have, uh, this is important, a low nose amplifier. This is important because the satellite, the signal coming from the satellite is very, very low. So we need to amplify. Then we have uh, an, analog an analog to digital converter. And this we have the automatic gain control, which is uh, a part that uh, tells you if you have some loss uh, in this conversion. And then uh, you, can, you pass some of the, the acquired signals uh, to different channels uh, in order to track the satellites. Uh, I try to be uh, more clear. And, sorry. And then, you have the, the unit of the, the computation unit, uh, which tells you, we process actually the signals coming from the different satellites and tells you the position. So, uh, in the first stage, uh, we have the, the acquisition stage. Uh, I actually didn't put in this slide a part in which the, the receiver generates the, the, the signals uh, into itself, but actually is located more or less here. In this part, uh, uh, we get uh, uh, the deposition stage, uh, which basically means uh, to get uh, a first row uh, estimation of the uh, signal delay at the Doppler measurement. The Doppler measure measurement are due to the fact that the satellites moves and also the receiver made moves. So that's why we have Doppler measurement. Then uh, when we get uh, uh, satellite acquired, uh, we pass it through a channel and then we, continue, we, we do the, the tracking stage uh, in which those estimations are refined uh, step by step. And then we pass the signal to the uh, PVT computation unit uh, and so then we get the, the position of, the, of our receiver. So uh, this is the, more or less the, the background uh, because uh, now I focus myself uh, uh, and my research to the GNSS uh, sensors for, uh, IoT, for IoT application and for IoT sensor. The main features that a GNSS uh, receiver must have for uh, uh, an IoT application are uh, small size, of course, because uh, IoT sensors actually uh, are small, probably. Uh, low cost, uh, hopefully. Uh, low power consumption, this is very important and good performance in terms of accuracy and integrity, which means that we don't have to get outlier in the positioning. And also robustness to attack, uh, because as I told you, the GNSS uh, power is very, very low, so it's very easy to attack. 
just a very small interrupt, I can uh, tell you two main sources of, uh, of attack, which are jamming and spoofing. Jamming means you have to add some noise at the same frequency of the signal received, and you can uh, you, uh, you make the receiver lose uh, totally the, the acquisition. A spoofing, uh, you generate actually a GNSS-like signals, uh, and so you make the receiver compute a very uh, different position, so a false position. Jam jamming could be uh, intentional or not. Or, uh, or not. Intentional jamming is uh, uh, forbidden by the law, but can you imagine where I get those pictures? Which is a jam? I get those pictures on eBay, so it's very easy to get uh, to get a jammer if you if you want. Uh, thinking about GNSS receiver, we can divide the uh, GNSS receivers uh, in uh, three big uh, categories. Actually, two, three, just in the last few years. Uh, we have geodetic receivers, for example, the receivers used for the GNSS thermal stations. They are very expensive, multi-constellation, multi-frequency, but they are also too big and they have very big antennas, so they are not suitable for the IoT applications. We have GNSS mass market uh, receivers, which are quite small, uh, typical single frequency, not double frequency. And uh, the order of price is uh, 200 euros. It depends on uh, different brands. And in the last years, uh, the problem of those uh, receivers, sorry, is that uh, actually they don't have many computational power, actually. And in the last years, uh, also smartphones can be used uh, as a, a GNSS receiver. So in my opinion, the, uh, the most suitable receivers for IoT application are smartphones. Starting from uh, May 2016, Google announced the uh, availability of road measurement from, uh, from the smartphone, which means that what happens before? Before May, uh, May 2016, we get uh, just the position from the satellite embedded on the smartphone and very few uh, other uh, information about the satellites. Starting from Android 7, Actually, we get uh, the row measurement, which are basically the distance between the satellite and the receiver, clock measurement, and uh, also noise measurement, and many other things. But the very important thing is that you get the measurement of the distance between the satellite and the receiver. In other words, if you remember the architecture of the, uh, of the GNSS receiver, uh, speaking about Android 6, uh, we, just got we just got here. Uh, getting the Android uh, so-called fine location, fine, fine position, sorry. But in Android 7, you can put yourself here. Uh, and so you have the data to calculate the, po the, the position yourself. This is important because uh, uh, the Android fine location uh, uh, computed by Google is not calculated or computed using just uh, GPS, but uh, it integrates GPS with any sensor and um, also from uh, uh, internet information that it gets. But you don't know the algorithm used by Google to uh, determine the so-called fine position. So uh, speaking about smartphones, uh, uh, we can say that uh, uh, all the new generation smartphones that, that they have, at least uh, Android, uh, Android 7, can have access to, uh, to road measurement, to road GNSS measurement. I put here two smartphones. The first one is very important. This is a Xiaomi Mi 8. I don't know if you have one, for example. Uh, this is the first uh, dual frequency uh, GNSS smartphone, which means that you have two, two frequencies, and in particular, you have the L1 and L5 frequency. Uh, this is very important because uh, uh, it gives you the opportunity to modulate some errors, like the ionosphere errors, uh, just uh, in, uh, uh, in a standard, standalone, I mean, uh, uh, using uh, uh, just this smartphone and non-external aidings. And uh, uh, the, uh, the Xiaomi Mi 8 uh, had uh, this chip, which is Broadcom BCM 477555, which is a uh, uh, dedicated uh, GPS uh, receiver embedded in the smartphone. Uh, and then the Xiaomi Mi 9. The Xiaomi Mi 9 actually has the processor, which is the uh, Qualcomm Snapdragon 850. 
55, sorry, um, in which has a GNSS receiver embedded. This is very important because uh, this chip is not mounted only in the Xiaomi Mi 9, as you probably know, but also in other different smartphones. Uh, you can think about, for example, uh, Oppo or uh, other brand, for example. So, uh, which means that uh, um, all the smartphones having this uh, uh, processor have the uh, dual frequency GNSS receiver uh, mounted or embedded in uh, embedded. Okay, and also um, the Xiaomi Mi 9 has uh, an Agar uh, Android, so uh, an, Agar, an Agar level of uh, API, and this means uh, for the GNSS part that you have access to more fields. I will be more precise later. Uh, speaking about uh, of apps for the registration of raw data, there are many apps on the Play Store, but I selected four of them. Uh, the first two. The first two are the G++ GNSS Logger and Rhinexon, which uh, are two apps that allows you to store information from the satellite in a Rhinex format. Uh, the Rhinex format uh, is a, a standard format. Uh, for example, if you have a, a receiver, the receiver, uh, the GNSS receiver, not, not a smartphone, it's, uh, it's the same, gives you the data in a proprietary format. Uh, and so, for example, uh, open source software is not saying that they can read those formats. And of course, uh, uh, other brand software for GNSS, procedure, for GNSS processing uh, doesn't read uh, this format, I mean. So Rhinex actually is a standard one. And more or less, Ogre receiver gives you also data in, uh, uh, in Rhinex format. And uh, uh, those two actually are uh, uh, the ones uh, developed by Google, which is GNSS Logger, and which is Gadipe. Gadipe is the uh, app that developed by four guys for the Galileo app competition. They, they won the, the first prize. And those two applications actually uh, store the data uh, not in Rhinex format, uh, but in a format uh, which is uh, a CSV, for example, and I call it Android format. But actually, it, it's a CSV. Uh, Gadipay is particularly. Um, I have to. I want to mention Gadipay because also in future uh, it will pro uh, this app promise to implement also some te uh, some techniques of pro uh, processing, so, which are for example the uh, under decay positioning. So in future, uh, Gadipay will be able to perform also positioning and not just record the recording of the, of the data. And they want. Uh, they want also to mention those application, which is RTK GPS Plus. Uh, which is the RTK Lib porting on Android. As I told you before, RTK Lib is a software for GNSS and RTK positioning, which is a, a software uh, free open source. And also, this, uh, this application is free open source, actually, is no longer supported, but uh, that's okay. The problem of this application is that uh, uh, doesn't read the, the data coming from the smartphone, but in it, uh, you need a GPS receiver or GNSS receiver to be plugged in the smartphone. So, uh, like in this case, for example, when I did uh, a test, we have a GNSS receiver, which is this one, and an external antenna. And then uh, uh, the, this application allows me to perform the, the positioning. But uh, uh, it's quite good because it's open source. It's not very good because uh, it doesn't read the data coming from the, from coming from the smartphone. Uh, so, talking about the, the state of art, I, I've read some uh, bibliography about the, these topics, and uh, I want to highlight uh, some uh, few issues about the GNSS signals coming from smartphone. The first one is the duty cycle. Uh, the duty cycle is a, a, a method implemented by, uh, by, by Google, actually, for saving uh, battery. For saving battery. Uh, this means that the, they give you the GPS uh, active just uh, for a fraction of a second and then uh, uh, they, kill the, they, they stop the GPS uh, receiver. And then uh, they activate the GPS for one other, account, one other fraction of a second and then stop the receiver and so on. This is quite good uh, for saving battery, 
and this is good for the code measurement, uh, but this is very bad for, for phase measurement because in this way you can't track uh, the satellite for uh, uh, continuously, and so you can solve the initial ambiguity. Uh, but starting from Android 8, uh, this problem can be uh, this uh, so called duty cycle can be disabled. Just you have to go on developer options and uh, uh, put and uh, dis disactivate. There is a flag. So actually. Uh, so you can, uh, you will, you will, uh, you will have, so, uh, of course, uh, um, either power. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the battery will uh, go down faster, but uh, you can track the satellite continuously. Another big issue is the low quality of the antenna mounted on the smartphone, uh, because the, the antenna used uh, for the GNSX signals is also used uh, for the GSM signals uh, for the. Uh, also, all the telecommunication used uh, in, the, in the smartphone. And uh, so the, the smartphone is very, very weak with respect to multipath. And also, yes, the, the power consumption is a, 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 could be a, a big issue. So uh, what my uh, PhD is focused on is to mitigate, uh, for example, so the, this error, in particular the, the multipath error, uh, via software in order to compensate uh, the, the low quality of the antenna. Uh, because, of course, you can, mm, it's not uh, suitable to, to, to use an external antenna on the, on the smartphone. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, you, can, you can change the hardware of, uh, of your smartphone. So uh, the, the idea is to uh, mitigate multipath uh, via software. To do that, uh, I, uh, me and uh, in GTL developed uh, an algorithm called the MDP algorithm for the multipath detection. But before speaking about MDP, I want to focus just a little bit on multipath. As I told you before, the multipath is the error that causes the reflection and the diffraction of, uh, of the signals coming from the satellite, which doesn't get straight forward to uh, the receiver. There are at least four mitigation levels for the multipath. The first one is the antenna placement. Of course, I can put the antenna on a rooftop where, for example, there are not obstacles. Uh, but this is not very interesting because, uh, uh, for example, the very mm, the most important, the most interesting application for the GNSS receiver are uh, the, the ones uh, when the, the GNSS receiver is used in urban canyon and in dynamic uh, context. So mm, the multipath uh, uh, there will be, and uh, so we have to. to to mitigate it, you can't put the, the smartphone on a rooftop and don't have multipath. Yes, of course they don't, but uh, <laughs> it's not uh, it's not interesting. The second one is the antenna type. Uh, for example, uh, many manufacturers of GNSS uh, uh, receivers uh, in produce antenna with particular gain factor in order, for example, not to get the signals reflected by the ground and things like that. But once again, it's not interesting for, smart, for smartphone because, uh, as I told you before, we can't modify the hardware of the smartphone. And the, uh, the, the antenna mounting of the, of, of the smartphone can get signals from everywhere, so also from the ground, for example. Another thing we can do is to uh, mitigate multipath at, uh, uh, receiver, uh, at receiver level. And the receiver level, for example, is, uh, means in acquisition stage. But once again, we don't have access in Android to the acquisition stage. So it's not, uh, in this case is not interesting one, one anymore for, uh, for smartphones. And lastly, at uh, the measurement computation, at measuring post-processing. In those cases, uh, we can actually uh, modify uh, or write some algorithm in order to recognize uh, and to uh, mitigate multipath. So, uh, as I told you before, the most challenging scenario for multipath uh, is when uh, uh, we are uh, using a, a dynamic receiver and, of course, uh, in real time. Uh, the first step to, to mitigate multipath uh, is to uh, produce, uh, to calculate uh, this observable, which is called code minus phase observable. You to I told you that there were the code measurement and the phase measurement, which basically are the measurement of the same things. Uh, I mean the, the, the distance between the satellite and the receiver. If I do the difference between this, those two observables, I um, I see, uh, I get these uh, these results. Uh, I don't write all the equation. Just trust me. I, that, that those are correct. 
I get the two times the ionosphere error because the ionosphere act in different signs uh, in code and multipath. I get the multipath error itself because uh, we can mitigate the multipath. The multipath is a, a random and a sudden uh, error, so it's not a, uh, we can't model it in, the, in that sense. We can the uh, number of the uh, wavelength, the integer wavelength between the satellite and the receiver, and also some uh, uh, other noise. We can see uh, so in those observables the multipath is uh, highlighted uh, between uh, other uh, other errors. The problem is that we still have the ionosphere error and the uh, integer ambiguity. So we have to get a variable that doesn't have those two uh, those two errors. So, so uh, GTEP developed uh, uh, an algorithm that mm, calculates a variable called multipath detection parameter in the ambit of the, uh, the project called GREP, which is GNSS Reliable Positioning. Uh, actually, the, uh, the GREP and MDP are uh, now under evaluation for the patent, so uh, I can tell you uh, much more about that, but I can assure you that uh, the multipath detection parameter doesn't have, is a variable strictly, strictly related to this uh, observable. It's very, very linked. But uh, I can assure you that it doesn't have the ionosphere and then the, uh, the number of the, of the uh, wavelength, or the, of the wavelength, sorry. And uh, uh, this, proce this procedure is uh, under evaluation for, uh, for the patent. And this uh, uh, kind of preprocess of the, of the data, I mean, uh, a filter of the, uh, of the satellites acquired, it determines which satellites are potentially affected by multipath, and then exclude those satellites for the positioning, because those satellites are probably like to produce an outlier in the outlier in the positioning. So, uh, the very first part of my PhD course and my PhD studies is to perform some tests. The first uh, the first thing was to, to choose. Uh, a smartphone in order to, to do some tests, and I decided to, to get the Xiaomi Mi 9 because, uh, as I told you before, it has the uh, Qualcomm Dragon A, uh, A5055, 50, 50, which is mounted also in, anime, in many other uh, smartphones, and so it could be considered, for example, a mass market uh, uh, solution, let's say. And uh, uh, the first goal of the, of the test were to, uh, to deal with data coming from smartphone, to uh, have sensibility of the precision uh, which can be obtained, and also to uh, start working also on uh, MDP, MDP variable and graph algorithm. So in the first test, uh, in the first test uh, I just did uh, an acquisition of data of 30 minutes uh, uh, using th uh, three apps uh, working in parallel. And uh, uh, for example, I used uh, the um, Google GNSS logger, uh, the um, Geo++ uh, Linux on, and uh, uh, Geo++ Linux logger and Linux on. There was the setup. Uh, I put the smartphone uh, on, the, on the rooftop of the university in, in, uh, in Dica, in uh, Villa Cambiaso. And uh, uh, the, first very, the first thing that I noted is that the Xiaomi Mi 9 doesn't have access to carrier face and no navigation message. So this is a very, very, very big issue not to have the carrier face. As you can see, this is a Rhinox format. You can see the observable uh, registered here. The first column refers to the carrier face, to the pseudo range, the code measurement. The second one uh, refers to the carrier face. This one is the Doppler measurement, and this is the CNO, which is the, uh, signal to ratio, the signal to noise ratio, is an indicator of the noise uh, of the signal. And those are, the, the, of course, the, the same variables for the uh, L5 frequency. So we can see no carrier phase at all. Uh, those are the variables coming from the, uh, Google, uh, uh, the Google API. The first two fields, uh, which is the uh, recited uh, time nanos and uh, its um, uncertainty, because uh, uh, I didn't tell you, but it's very important that uh, uh, the library 
doesn't get you uh, the pseudo range of the carrier phase, but you have to calculate that. Simply applying uh, this equation. So nothing is not too, not too difficult, but you don't have uh, direct the, the, the pseudo range. So those two fields are used to calculate the, these terms. The other one is calculated by the uh, GNSS plot variable. Uh, okay. This these are the uh, the these are the carrier phase. So the the measurement, uh, the, the measurement, the phase measurement. As you can see, I all I always get uh, the ideal state uh, value zero, which means they are invalid or unknown. You can see just a, a screenshot of the GS book coming from the, the library, and you can see here the carrier phase output zero. Uh, the pseudo range meter per second uh, and the relative uncertainty are the Doppler measurement. CNO, which is the, uh, the carrier, to, carrier to, to noise uh, ratio. And once, uh, lastly, the multipath indicator. Multipath indicator um, is just an indicator of the multipath. We don't know actually how uh, it acts. Uh, I just uh, didn't find uh, many literature on uh, this parameter, but I have the chance to speak uh, uh, with some expert uh, from this sector during, for example, uh, summer school. And uh, they told me that there is an indicator uh, uh, of the, um, in the part of the acquisition stage, uh, but we, uh, I don't, we didn't know uh, how actually it uh, act. And the uh, only value that I get for the multipath indicator is zero. That the multi uh, the means that the indicator is not available or the multipath is unknown. This is very strange because uh, during my all my test, uh, I put the smartphone in a place that the multipath uh, is very likely to happen. So I expect, for example, to, uh, to get uh, the multipath indicator value just one, because of course I expect to get multipath. So these are the plots of the pseudo range for the coming from the two apps. Actually, you can find the, the blue one because it's overlapped to the, the green one. This is for the satellite G10, which is a GPS satellite. Uh, I referred, sorry, referred to the frequency L1. Those are, whoops, those are the same uh, measurement, but uh, for the satellite G10 and also for the frequency L5. Uh, those are the difference between the, uh, the, pseudo, the pseudo range difference in uh, satellite uh, L1. Okay. And those are the difference between the, uh, the, the two applications. We can see an error of 10 uh, at 5 meters, which is very strong because which is very strange because I used the three applications working in parallel. At the same time, I didn't expect to get so many difference between uh, the, the same measurement measured once by an app and uh, by two different apps. I mean. And uh, those are the difference between two other applications, uh, between two. And once again, I get uh, those very big errors. Actually, I did. I find out uh, that uh, the, uh, I have some backup slides. Maybe later I can show you if you are interested. But uh, I find out that the two applications actually didn't work uh, uh, very in parallel, but uh, get the computation, get the information uh, difference in a very um, difference in time. I mean. There is a very little difference in time, but if you multiply this difference in time for the speed of light, you can get this kind of error. What is important to underline is that the, the trend is totally the same. So this is, this is uh, uh, encouraging, because uh, if I get a different trend between uh, uh, the, the third range coming from different apps, it will be a very, uh, very, very strange. Uh, those bias uh, is due to the fact that the app actually doesn't work in parallel. Uh, okay, I can get, uh, for example, here some uh, uh, holes, uh, but uh, that are due to the fact that uh, uh, those information come from uh, 
the uh, Google GNSS logger that, uh, as I told you, doesn't give you the information in a Rhinox format, uh, but I use the Python library for translate uh, the CSV in a Rhinox format. Uh, and probably this Python library has some bug, uh, and so I get those, uh, those holes for, the, for that reason. But once again, uh, there are the same plot uh, for, for example, Galileo satellite, because uh, if satellite's name starts with E, it means that it's a Galileo one. Okay, so uh, the more important things uh, that uh, has to be underlined for the first test uh, are, uh, are those the L frequency. L5 frequency seems to be more discontinuous than the uh, L1 frequency. You can, we can see, for example, uh, here. Okay, there are, these are the same measurement of the same uh, using just the L1 frequency and the L5 frequency. The L5 frequencies seems to be uh, more difficult to track, so more discontinuous in time. And also, the second, uh, this is valid uh, for also for all the satellites. And uh, I, I want to underline also an instability of the Python library to translate uh, the, uh, the CSV format in, into a Rhinox format, but this is not that interesting. I mean. Those are the position obtained. I process the data using RTK Leap software, and I get the position coming from the three different apps. Well, what we can see is that the position is very the same for the three app uh, uh, every uh, every epoch. So we, we can have just a difference of millimeters, which is fine. So uh, what we can understand is that we can. Uh, it's not important to use an app or another to to register uh, GNSS data. The second test uh, was performed uh, also in uh, Villa Cambiaso here in, uh, in the University of Genoa. And I did an acquisition of 90 minutes uh, using in parallel three different uh, uh, GNSS receivers. A geodetic one, uh, two frequency, a mass market GNSS receiver, and a smartphone here. Uh, okay, so uh, actually in the smartphone uh, I got uh, the three app working in parallel, but uh, we can for that aspect uh, I got the same consideration as, the, as before, so I don't repeat the, those considerations. Which is important uh, is to underline the, the trend of the CNO, uh, CNO because uh, for the smartphone the CNO is very, very low. Um, the more the CNO is high, the better it is. And for example, for a genetic receiver, the CNO uh, is between uh, 50, 55, 40 uh, dB Hertz, while, for a while uh, the CNO coming for a smartphone usually stands between 35, 30 C dB Hertz. So that's not very good. It means that the uh, signals are quiet, but the smartphone are very, very noisy. But uh, uh, of course, uh, this uh, kind of analysis must be uh, must be deepened. Here you can see the difference uh, in position between the three receivers. I also process the data uh, using uh, RTK Leap software, and I get the, the blue data are the data coming from the smartphone, one position for every second. So we can gain an, uh, this extent uh, or the extent of this point cloud. Let's say it's in the order of 20 meters. And I have most, and I have many outliers, as you can see here. And uh, uh, but we can say that this is quite uh, uh, precise because uh, the point cloud is centered on the point where the GNSS uh, receiver actually was. Then I got the position from the uh, U blocks, which is the mass market uh, receiver, and I get, of course, uh, a point cloud which is uh, uh, shorter. I mean, lower. And uh, the best one uh, is the, the ones coming from the geodetic receiver. Those are expected results. I didn't explain nothing new. I didn't, I didn't find out uh, nothing new. But uh, just to have, uh, uh, not just to have some numbers, I mean, uh, just to compare the, uh, the precision coming from a smartphone with that one coming from a geodetic, uh, a geodetic receiver. The geodetic receiver in standalone has an extension of a few meters, which is also a result expected. 
Then I wanted to post-process the data with the observation of another GNSS receiver, which is the ones uh, uh, are coming from the permanent station of the of Genu. Genu is a permanent station of uh, uh, Regione Liguria Net. If you, see, if you remember uh, one of the first slides I told you about the NRTK positioning, uh, there are many uh, GNSS permanent station acquiring satellites and generate uh, corrections. Uh, once uh, of the station is uh, mounted uh, on the, uh, the Opera Pia building in the engineering faculty. And so I process the data between uh, the, my receivers and that receivers. The very uh, big, uh, the, the goal of, the, of this kind of processing is to determine the uh, integer wavelength between the satellite and the receiver and get an accurate, a more, an, a more accurate position. So this operation can be done for, ex for the geodetic receiver and for the mass market receiver, but can't be done for the smartphone as I don't have the, fire, uh, the carrier phase measurement. So here you can just see that uh, the, uh, the point clouds uh, uh, reduce from uh, uh, meter order to centimeter orders. And I use RTK-Lib to uh, process those data. Uh, for example, you can get uh, both fixed position and float position, which means in fixed position that uh, this ambiguity is uh, fixed uh, in uh, an integer number, so it is correct, let's say, and also this ambiguity can be fixed as float, and float means that the, uh, the ambiguity is not fixed, it's fixed as a float number, so it's not correct but uh, is, com is uh, more precise uh, that uh, that the, the, the standalone position. What I want also to underline is that if I use a different uh, software for GNSS positioning, uh, I can get uh, different results. It is, this depends uh, on the algorithm uh, implemented in the software. In RTK-Lib, I can see the, all the equation, uh, all the algorithms, because the software is open source. In Top Contours, uh, which is a, a proprietary software, I, can, I can't uh, see the, the algorithms that he implemented in order to process the data. Um, but uh, we have to, I have to focus on about uh, multipath, and I have to, uh, in order to do that, uh, I have to get the, the color phase from the, from the smartphone. So uh, what I did is to, just to understand which is the problem, I tried to join the uh, GNSS, the GSA, which is the uh, European uh, GNSS Agency, Rome Measurement Task Force, which is a group of researchers and uh, PhD students uh, or scientists uh, interested uh, in the road measurement coming from smartphone. And uh, the, the pro to, to get in, uh, in, those, in those group is to have the access of a forum for uh, discussion and get uh, the ba uh, database of uh, road measurement coming from smartphone if someone uploads that. And, uh, um, for example, uh, come just asking questions uh, uh, and receiving answer. I found out that the only smartphone with uh, uh, dual frequency GNSS receiver and access to carrier phase, uh, the carrier phase is the Xiaomi Mi 8, which I don't have. So, uh, thanks to the Gadip developer team, which are four guys that I had the pleasure to meet uh, during uh, the conference uh, during uh, summer school. Uh, I had the, um, the opportunity to work uh, um, with a data set coming from a Xiaomi Mi 8 that they passed to me. Their application is the best in the world, so you have to download. Just joking. So, so uh, I get the, uh, I made a Linux parser using, uh, using Python, but it's not uh, important that I use Python, actually in order to store all the information from a Rhinox file to a SQLite database. The Rhinox format, the Rhinox file is structured like that. You have a first row containing the observation time and the number of satellites registered, and then all the information of the satellites acquired in those, in those, in those epochs. So I plotted the, I compute and plotted the MDP variable, and uh, I, well, what I can tell you that uh, if the satellites uh, exceed those value, 
you have to exclude this satellite uh, from the positioning. Uh, the computation of these two thresholds uh, actually is still uh, uh, a, research, uh, a research point and uh, we have also we are not that sure uh, about the, the evaluation of the of these thresholds uh, but uh, i can tell you that they are sort they are sorted out uh, using uh, some statistics uh, and on the basis of uh, uh, a lot of tests done uh, in the in the past so this threshold actually depends uh, on the uh, on the environment that uh, in the the environment that you are for example if you are in a urban canyon you can use uh, a threshold if you are uh, in an open sky you can use uh, another threshold and uh, uh, they do they take into the account that uh, uh, the distance uh, the actual distance calculated between the satellite and the receiver if we uh, if we have multipath is higher than the, if the satellites come straight forward to the receiver the signals from the satellite come straight forward to the receiver what we can note is that for satellites uh, uh, of, uh, of the frequency L1, uh, the frequency L1 is much more noisier than the frequency L5. In, in this case, uh, for example, the frequency L5, uh, if I use just the frequency L5 to process and uh, compute uh, the, the position, I didn't have to exclude uh, any satellites, uh, or those satellites, I didn't have to exclude those satellites for the positioning in uh, any time. Why, if I had to process the uh, satellite of the, the signals of the satellite for the L1 frequency, I had to exclude the satellite, this satellite, uh, many times uh, in the computation of the position. Same consideration for the Galileo satellites. So uh, now uh, this is my work plan. I want to finish to understand uh, uh, the, the understanding, sorry, of the data coming coming from smartphone. In order to understand uh, if it's better to implement uh, the uh, MDP algorithm in an app that already done GNSS positioning, for example, the RTK GPS Plus that I mentioned before, or is better to to develop an app myself and. Uh, in this, uh, in this uh, context, I want to, to cite the, uh, the work done by Manuel Viaggi for his uh, Bachelor of Thesis that uh, he developed an app for the uh, registration of the satellite coming from, the, for the signals coming from the satellite. Uh, we, think, uh, we thought about the, how to structure this application and we decided to uh, structure the, to record the, both the signals coming from the satellite, but also uh, the, the information coming from other sensors embedded on the smartphone. Because, uh, for example, they can be used to uh, compute uh, the, the position. Like, for example, the, uh, the algorithm developed by Google does. And uh, also we decided to make a connection to, to a server in order to send all the uh, to send uh, all the information or the information from the satellite to a server and in, uh, in a such way that it can be processed together with the information of uh, another smartphone so in few words uh, is to compute a sort of rtk positioning in order if uh, that the, the two smartphones are not too far one from each other they can compensate the the error in the computation of the of the position uh, working for uh, speaking about uh, uh, the MDP uh, in Android, I have uh, or, or uh, of the MDP in general, I have to work uh, both uh, on the, the, the thresholds and uh, in, the, in the sense that I have to understand if the threshold can be, if the definition of this threshold must be improved uh, or. Uh, one other thing that uh, uh, can be implemented, for example, is to uh, implement, to implement uh, an, an algorithm that change uh, in the receiver the, the value of the threshold while the environment around the view is changing. For example, if I'm doing uh, a kinematic acquisition of test and I start my acquisition in an open sky, I have to use a value of threshold, but I suddenly can uh, come into, uh, for example, an uh, urban canyon, and so the threshold that I used uh, maybe five seconds before is not more uh, suitable, so in automatic I have to change uh, these thresholds. What I expect uh, 
to, to obtain uh, is, uh, while the MDP algorithm will be implemented is that uh, the outliers uh, uh, that uh, were uh, shown in the, some slides before will disappear and so the positioning will be more reliable and at the same time more precise. Thank you for your attention. Assumptions are made. Uh, th those uh, value of, uh, for example, RMS uh, or standard deviation uh, are computed by the, the software I used uh, for the, the processing. Uh, I have to set. Uh, I have. I can set some uh, parameters uh, uh, in order, for example, to say, uh, okay, my receiver is in uh, uh, static condition or in dynamic condition. Uh, and uh, in those sense, uh, the, those values will be uh, calculated uh, in a different way because uh, the, the software takes into account, uh, uh, for example, many environmental conditions in which the survey is carried out, for example. But uh, those uh, values come from uh, the computation of a Kalman filter that uh, actually it was the, pro the, it was the, the program uh, actually does. It uses an extended common filter for sorting out the position. Just some questions you see the image there. Why are some cloud points not circles? I mean, from a naive point of view, I would expect them to be circles. But yeah. they seem like I'm colorless, so maybe I don't see them. Uh, okay, but you mean that one is a circle? One? They, some of them, there's some other ones. Seem uh, thin and longer, so like the direction. Okay, this is a um, probably uh, this is a problem uh, of the antenna, and um, what the, this one in particular, this is not actually actually circle. It depends uh, on what the, you can set uh, on the uh, on the receiver. Uh, actually, I used uh, a uh, U-Blocks receiver, which is. Uh, uh, Oops, sorry. Uh, well, um, a moment. I show. I will show. I will, uh, here. Okay. Uh, this is the antenna. This is not a, a very good one because it's a patch antenna. And uh, uh, the. Um, Mm, I mean, uh, if I changed uh, the antenna and I used uh, a more uh, accurate one, uh, I would got uh, a circled, uh, a circled uh, point part. That's the main reason why. Uh, so, concerning the real carrier phase, something that I think is faster. So, the error is the position of the yeah, of course. If I got, if I, if I could process the the carrier phase measurement, uh, I would got a smaller point cloud. The point is that the wavelength of the GPS is 19 centimeter, and what I measure is the, a shift between two wavelengths, so uh, less than 19 centimeters. So I can make an error in the estimation of the shift, which is in the order of centimeters. So uh, if I use the, car in the, the pseudo range, in order to compute the distance between the satellite and the receiver, I use the uh, difference in time. If I use, if I make uh, an error uh, in, in estimating the times, uh, I have to multiply it, uh, this error for the speed of light uh, 
uh, in order to get uh, a to convert it in meters, uh, and they get an error which is in the order of the meters. That's why the code. Uh, oh, what? That's why the, um, the, the, the the pseudo range are less precise than the carrier phase. So if, if you are if you are going to be mi eight instead of mi nine, then uh, you should get uh, yeah. much more precise. Yeah. But you know how much precise is that? I expect. Uh, um, well, also speaking during the, the cyber schools uh, that I attended uh, and uh, speaking with the guys uh, that developed uh, Galipe, they can obtain uh, also submeter accuracy with the smartphone in very particular condition. So I can promise that if I buy uh, a Xiaomi and buy 8 and I'm doing a test here, I can get, uh, for example, decametric or uh, decimetric, sorry, uh, positioning errors. Uh, but uh, in uh, determined uh, condition, I can get, uh, yes, less than a uh, meter of course. Any questions? Thank you again. Thank you again. This was the last PhD seminar of the year. So stay tuned for updates uh, on the next edition of the of the of our cycle of seminars. So thanks again for this year.